Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alex. I'm a senior here at the University of Washington, and my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. After being liberated from Bergen-Belsen, she immigrated to New York City to start a new life. Rabbi Mendel asked me to open the evening and to give my perspective on how this tragedy that happened all the way back in the 1940s still holds so much significance for us today. Before I do that, I'd like to thank Rabbi Mendel and Miriam for all their support with Chabad here at the University of Washington. Chabad hosts many events for us, from dinners every, Shabbat dinners every Friday to celebrating the other Jewish holidays. Chabad is my home away from home. It's a welcoming place for me for anything, from moral support to a place to hang out to delicious food. I believe that Chabad is important because it helps us continue our Jewish culture despite the troubles of our times. Today, a lot of hate still exists. And evil still targets us, still in Hitler's name. And the very best thing that we can do is to still be here. And we will be here. And we will be proudly Jewish. Chabad makes this possible for people like myself here at the University of Washington. Next, I would like to touch on why I feel it's so important for us to host this event and the reason that I think all of you came here today. I'm sure most of us have heard the quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. But this rings true in our world every day. Many people dismiss the Holocaust as the nadir of humanity. But in doing so, we're turning our backs on the inhumanities of our modern day. The Holocaust is a critical piece of history because it teaches us about the atrocities that we, human beings, are capable of, not just 75 years ago, but now. We can never assume that history cannot repeat itself. We must always be cognizant of current events and can never become complacent with today's news. Unfortunately, many parallels to the Holocaust still exist today. Recently, we've seen an increase in hate crimes, including a significant rise in anti-Semitism. So to be here and be part of this event of human history helps us prepare to make our future a better place. My grandmother always looked at me, smiled, and proudly proclaimed, here's proof that Hitler lost. So I say this, you being here tonight, celebrating tolerance, acceptance, and the humanity that we all share is proof that Hitler did in fact lose. Evil has no chance as long as we're here together. Thank you all for coming and thank you for having me speak to you. I'd like to thank and call up to the stage tonight's presenting sponsor, Michelle Barnett of Stay Pineapple. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of people here, and this is phenomenal. I'd like to extend a very, very warm welcome and a big thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Stay Pineapple Hotels is so honored to have partnered with the University of Washington in this, what is promising to be an extraordinary evening and a wonderful conversation. I thought I would share a really quick story with you all. I wouldn't want to bore you. So I think that uh, it sort of is reflective of why conversations like this evening hold such power for my family and for our company. Because awareness raising, that is what we must do. That's our responsibility. So on a lighter note, in 2013, I had a little boy who was born in 2000, who in 2013 was going to have a bar mitzvah. We started arranging his bar mitzvah, and we thought, well, what if we had it at the Western Wall in Jerusalem? Wouldn't that be special? So planned a trip. Off we went in May of 2013. And we had a wonderful time. For those of you that have, are from Israel, have been to Israel, you know what an extraordinary trip it always is, always different. Max had never been, so we had a great time. We went and we uh, had the ceremony. It was phenomenal. It was a beautiful moment. Family was there, and then we went and we floated in the Dead Sea. Actually, Max pushed me over to make sure that you could float before he went in. But you know, that's what you are when you're 13. And then 
actually karma came back because Max rode a camel named Mazel who spit at him. So it was all good. We played on the beach, we ate falafel, we had a wonderful time. And then on the itinerary of the two-week trip came, in, came up Yad Vashem. It was time to go visit the Holocaust Museum. So we got there, and I have been through it before, as well as my family had, except Max had not. So we're halfway through the museum, and for those of you that know the museum, you know how somber and powerful is, I guess, the best word for it. About half, about a couple hours in, and there's no Max. And I can't find Max. So I look all over the museum, and I go back in the corner, and there is this man-child wide-eyed and wet-eyed. And he stared at me, and I think at that point he was only six feet, wasn't six three yet. And he said, Mom, how could this have happened? And I stared at him, and I, I said, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. But we have a responsibility to be here, and for you to tell your children and the children beyond that, but I don't have any answers for you, love. And in that moment, I think truly the rite of passage, a boy became a man, and his heart broke. We finished the museum, and as most of you in your mind's eye who have been there, or if you haven't been there, make a trip. Close your eyes, and as you leave Yad Vashem, you have, there's an austere wall, sort of cement. I can see it in my mind. And on that wall is the letters, are the words, Never forget, never again. And Max and I stood there and we read that. And it was really, really powerful. Here was this child who had grown up in Sammamish with the Holocaust as a conversation around a Jewish table. Uh, he'd gone to wonderful schools. He'd learned about it in the pages of books. Nothing was as searing as being immersed in it. So that's why we're so pleased and so honored to be here tonight and to support this community event, to work with the university and work with Ava and allow us this treasure to immerse ourselves and hear the story so that never we never forget and never again to anyone. So on that note, I'm going to introduce Rabbi and it's my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Mendel Weingarten, the co-director of Chabad. My New York Jewish friends would be so proud of me for saying Chabad like that. Uh, the, organi the organization um, hosting tonight's event and commonly referred to as the home away from home for every Jewish husky. Rabbi? Wow, wow. To fill this room was a dream and a vision that we took on five months ago. Eva, what you see here tonight is in your honor, to your credit, and you absolutely deserve it. We did not get here on our own, nor could we have. A huge thank you goes to the heroes of tonight. Let's hear it for the University of Washington student body. Each and every one of our sponsors, Stay Pineapple, Volvo Cars Seattle, Volvo Cars Bellevue, BECU, Wells Fargo, WSECU, the McGill family, and the Restivo family. Please join me in welcoming the Provost of the University of Washington, Dr. Mark Richards, and his wife, Dr. Sarah Nunberg. The earliest fans and supporters of Chabad at University of Washington are here with us tonight. Please recognize Rabbi and Mrs. Levitin and the representing Chabad Shluchim from throughout the city and state.
I knew it was a stretch when I invited President Kause to lead tonight's conversation. Let me publicly state, I am so happy and proud that you accepted this honor and worked the miracles it took to fit this into your very tight schedule. A timely and relevant story. In September of 2003, the Polish government held an event to celebrate the 85th anniversary of the Polish Air Force. They invited many countries, Israel among them, to send contingents of jets from their own air forces to take part in the festivities. As a precondition to their participation, the Israeli Air Force insisted that their contingent's itinerary include a flyover above the Auschwitz concentration camps. Upon hearing this demand, the Polish curators of the Auschwitz Museum vehemently objected. What? Send these loud, deafening military aircraft over Auschwitz? This is totally inappropriate, disrespectful, and irreverent. It's a disturbance of the peace and quiet of this very solemn place. You, you can't make this stuff up. The Polish authorities telling Israel what the appropriate manner is for paying tribute to the memory of the six million. The Israelis were determined and the Poles relented. On that incredible day, a contingent of Israeli F-15 fighter jets, each of them piloted by children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, took off towards the sacred, haunted, and dreadful resting place of their parents and grandparents. In the cockpits, these crew members carried with them the names of all those recorded murdered at Auschwitz. The jets proudly displaying the blue star of David flew towards the concentration camp as slowly as possible following the railroad tracks leading into the camps and crematoriums, and then peeled away with a tremendous roar. No, it was not a quiet tribute to the millions who perished, nor was it meant to be. In the words of the Israeli ambassador to Poland, Shevach Weiss, this quiet had to be disturbed, and it had to be disturbed by the roar of Israeli F-15 fighter jets. Today, once again, the world is being filled with hatred, animosity, and brutality. In living memory of the Holocaust, anti-Semitism is sharply on the rise. Silence is not an option. The deafening silence of passivity must be broken with a roar of moral courage. I must speak up, you must raise your voice, and together we must take a stand. This is what President Kause does. This is what Eva Schloss does. And this, my friends, is what we must do. Please join me in welcoming University of Washington President Anamari Kause and the star of tonight's evening, Eva Schloss, champion of Holocaust education. I just want to very briefly say what a great pleasure it is to welcome you all to what really is a once-in-a-lifetime event. Before we begin, I want to thank Rabbi Mendel Weingarten and Miriam Weingarten and Habat UW who made this event possible, as well as our event sponsors, including Michelle Barnett of State, of State Pineapple. And I've stayed with them in San Francisco. They're a great, great chain. 
Um, I also want to thank all the student volunteers, especially the student in charge, Levi Men, for his tireless work to make this event a success. Our great public university is driven by our mission of impact, to leave the world better than we found it. You know that I'm a very, very optimistic person, and usually when you hear me talk, it's about how we can build on our common humanity. And that is absolutely what I'm about, what this university is about, what Eva is about. But we also need to be a convener of some conversations that are, quite frankly, difficult. And that's part of our mission as well. And we must, as a university, as individuals, as a society, we must confront the unimaginable horror of the Holocaust if we are to prevent it from happening again. Let's not one moment forget that this could happen again if we are not vigilant. By telling her story, Eva has inspired countless people to work for a more tolerant, inclusive world. And I hope that all of you will take a piece of that inspiration, that we'll all take that with us tonight. Her life story is both painful and powerful. And I know on a, that I speak for all of us when I say how grateful the UW is to get to hear her story and learn from her life's journey. Her message, quite frankly, is more important now than it has ever been, at least in my lifetime. So Eva, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Let's come off again. Oh dear. So Eva. Um, oh, it's on still. It's on, okay. Uh, yeah, I think it's okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Well, thank you very, very much for coming, everybody. Um, I hope we'll have a good debate, and um, I'll tell you my story. And um, yes, it is, like I've heard, it is very, very important not to forget and not to repeat this. So can you tell us a little bit about your story and why it's so important to you to be telling it now? Oh. <laughs> um, <coughs> Well, um, I was brought up in Vienna, a beautiful city, a beautiful country, and um, in a lovely family. And this is really what gave me the basis of a good um, um, uh, life. And, um, but suddenly, all this collapsed when in 1938, the Nazis, without any warning, uh, occupied Austria. Um, we had many Christian friends, you know, at that time you didn't kind of ask what, what nationality have you, where you come from. Um, Austria used to be a big, big empire. It lost all this in the First World War. And so there was a big mixture of people living in Vienna. The emperor, Franz Josef, he actually encouraged Jewish people to come to Vienna. So there was a highly cultured country with a lot of um, art and uh, theatre and um, all kind of new art systems were uh, developed. In the there. Um, Freud was as there. Um, it was really one of the most cultured country in Europe. And um, the Nazis were going to destroy all this. Um, in Austria, you had to have uh, religious education in school. In America, you don't have that. So um, the Jewish children were called out in the, from their class, and we went into a different classroom. We had um, Bible stories, a little bit of Hebrew, some Hebrew songs, but as well the festivals we learned. And um, so we went home to our parents and wanted um, to, to celebrate all those uh, wonderful festivals as well. So through teaching the children, we really got our parents more interested again in the religion. And um, <coughs> so everybody knew in school um, who was a Jew. And as soon as the Nazis had come in, 
I experienced for the very first time anti-Semitism. My brother too, he was 12 years old. He came home the next day after the Nazis had come in and um, his clothes were torn, his, his face was full of blood, he looked terrible. And when my parents questioned him, what on earth has happened to you? He said, my own friends did that and the teachers just watched it happening. Um, me too, my best friend was a Catholic girl on the way home. I usually stopped off there to play. But the next day, the, um, when I got there, I could see the mother looked very, very cross at me. And um, I didn't feel guilty because we hadn't had a quarrel. And the mother said, we never want to see you here again. And she slammed the door in my face. I went crying home and I said to my mother, we didn't have a quarrel, why is all this happening? And my mother explained, for Jewish people, life is going to be very, very difficult from now on. Now the other terrible, terrible thing was, by um, 1938, the world in general had closed the doors for Jewish emigration. Um, from Germany, um, before that, in 1932, 33, 34, when it started to be a bit dicey for Jewish people, it was still possible to find a new home somewhere in the world. Um, Otto Frank, Anna's father, who later became my stepfather, um, always told us and our children when he heard in the street there was a very famous Nazi song, when Jewish blood drips from our knives, things is going to get good again. He said, when I heard this singing, I realized this is not a country where I want to bring up my family. So he was able to get out still to Holland in 1933 to Amsterdam. Um, <coughs> so we were actually very, very lucky that eventually we could leave as well. My father had business connections in Holland. He ha had inherited a shoe factory from his parents, his father. And um, in Holland, in the south, was a big shoe industry. And he had been export and he had business there. So somehow, of course, you know, I didn't know all this till much later. He was able to get out. And he said, as soon as I'm ready to find some accommodation for you, my mother, my brother, and me, um, I'll send for you. But by that time, when it was, I think it was several weeks later, the borders were closed as well. Um, eventually, we were able to escape to Belgium, and there as well, um, French speaking, I was 10 years old, I had never heard about French, so I was put in a classroom, uh, people looked at me as if I was dropped down from the moon, <laughs> and um, nobody wanted to speak to me, and I lost all my, my certainty, I was a very, uh, a happy child, but I got very, very um, miserable, you know, I, could, I didn't know what was going on, I had no friends, we lived in a little boarding house, we didn't have much money, it was really a big, big shock. And, um, but you know, children adapt and eventually learn the language, and it was my 10th uh, birthday, and I wanted a little birthday party in Vienna, I had always lovely birthday parties, and the landlady, where we had two rooms, um, said, yes, you can invite five girls. And I did, and the day of my birthday, all those children brought a note from their parents, they are not allowed to come to my party. Um, again, I cried again, and um, my mother said, well, obviously, they don't want to mix with Jewish refugees. So, you know, um, and Unfortunately, this reminds me very, very much on now again, there are millions, millions and millions of refugees trying to escape from war-torn um, countries with their family. Um, their houses disappeared, their town, their village has been bombed. There are no hospital for the children who have been uh, maimed, and they try to find a new home, and again, the world closed the gate to them. <laughs> so in this respect, the world has not really learned anything. Well, that's a lot of why you're here. 
I don't, you've already shared some very difficult experiences, um, but I think part of what we'd like to hear a little bit about was the camp and what that was like and how you survived. Well, it was not immediately, of course, a camp. So um, we lived in Belgium and father uh, lived in Amsterdam, in Holland. And um, the war was starting already in 1940. Hitler had already conquered um, Czechoslovakia and went into Poland and the Second World War was had started. Mm -hmm. And my father was desperate to get a visa for us to come to Amsterdam. And in February 1940, we got a visiting visa to stay for three months in Amsterdam. My father hired a furnished apartment because we couldn't bring anything out of Austria on the Merveda plan. This was a sort of a triangle with a little skyscraper in the middle and some Ger um, Ger German refugees had settled there. And, uh, and if you live in apartments, there are no yards for children to play. So they came out um, after school and we played on this open um, place. And one day a little girl came to me, introduced herself, very well brought up. Her name was Anne Frank. We were both 11 years old and um, she uh, realized I didn't speak much Dutch and um, she took me up to her family and that is how I met Otto Frank, her sister and her mother. And we became friends, but through my experience, I was still shy, but she was very outgoing. She was a big chatterbox. Her nickname was Mrs. Quack Quack. Uh, <laughs> she had to stay behind in school very often, write hundred lines. I'm not going to talk so much in class, <laughs> but um, she just couldn't help it. And um, when I told her I had an older brother, she said, when can I come and meet him? <laughs> because she was already very interested in boys with 11 years old. <laughs> um, so, you know, life seemed good again. I got a bicycle and the Dutch children were very welcoming. And um, I thought, well, we like it here. But again, it didn't last very long because in May at night we heard um, aeroplanes and we put on the radio and the newsreader said, terrible news, the Germans are trying to invade our country, but we are going to defend it ourselves. Well, this little country had no chance against the might of the Germans. And as well, the war had changed. They landed behind the um, army with parachutes, thousands of parachutes um, landed and they started to conquer the country. And it was the first time in that war that a civilian city had been bombed. Rotterdam, 10,000 casualties. And the warning went out, if they are not going to capitulate, we are going to bomb all your city. So the second bad thing was that the royal family escaped. And that was very discouraging, of course, for the people. They went first to England and later to Canada. And you know, you had to make very, very quick decisions. The and the afterwards, the Nazis went into Belgium and the Belgian king decided he would cooperate with the Nazis, thinking he can help his population. After the war, he had to abdicate because he was considered a traitor. So whatever measures you took, it was a wrong decision. It was really, really difficult. We still tried to escape to England, but there was no ship left. So we realized, we'll see what happens. And at first, nothing really happened. So the Germans wanted to be not um, the enemy, but the Dutch, of course, are very proud people, didn't want to be occupied. And in all the occupied countries, that was very, very important. They formed a movement called the Resistance and they did all kind of things. They shot particularly bad Nazis, they blew up trains, they printed ration cards, they had their own newspaper, they helped the pilots who were shot down, Allied pilots, and all kind of wonderful things they did. But they were, of course, in danger as well. And then we had to wear the Jewish star, and then people started to be arrested and disappeared. After two years, living in fear, especially my father and my brother, 
um, they went after the young man. Um, about 10,000 young people got a notice to be deported to Germany to work in German factories. Well, by that time, in 1942, already in Germany, most Jews had been deported. So why do they invite more Jews? Um, so my father called us together, and he said to Hans, you are not going, we are going to go into hiding. And I questioned that, what you mean hiding? Adults don't go hiding. And my father explained, I found um, some wonderful people who are going to offer their home to us um, and keep us safe. But I couldn't find a house or people who were going to take in four people because the apartments are quite small in Holland. So um, we are going to split up again. I will go with my mother and Heinz will go with him. And I started to cry. I was 13 years old. I didn't want to be separated. I was very, very close to my brother and my father. And my father explained, if we're in two different places, the chance the two of us will survive is bigger. So, survive. So I think this was the first time when I realized it was a matter of life and death. So this is pretty scary. So this is what happened. And that was the same time Anna's sister Margot got this call up notice as well. And they went into hiding um, in Otto Frank's office. And I'm sure some of you have been there and seen where that happened. So quite a bit different from our situation because they were, there were eight people and I was just with my mother. We had to sit the whole day, like you and me sit here, and we took our lunch. We were not allowed to move around when the people were out at work in case neighbors would hear footsteps, then they might think they're burglars. So we had to sit still. And I was a very sporty child, very lively. But not and easy for a young teenager. To, to sit, can you imagine, day in, day out. And the very worst thing was the Nazis knew that um, not, not all those people who had the call-up notice had appeared. So where are those people? And they really wanted to get every Jew. So they did house searches. So at night, there was a knock on the door, and people had to open and let the people, the Nazis, search, search their homes. So in all the different hiding places where we were, we had a hiding place within the hiding place, meaning that the people from the resistance, again, those wonderful people, came, looked over their apartment, and built a false partition with a trap door, sometimes under the floorboard, sometimes in a wardrobe. So when the knock came, we quickly went there. But um, a, a story, for instance, made the round that in another home, as well, the same thing was happening. The Nazis came. It was always at night. And um, people were quickly going into their hiding place, but the beds were still warm. So they realized there were people. So they demolished the whole apartment till they found the people. And the host people, of course, were taken away as well. So when people hear this story, they said, you know, I can't take the tension any longer. You have to move to somewhere else. So we moved perhaps seven times in the two years we were in hiding. So with Frank, it was different because they were in Otto Frank's office, so they were relatively safe. There were no house searches there. Um, <coughs> in, um, in May 1944, so after two years, my father and my brother were in the country, and uh, he phoned my mother. We were on the, in touch by phone, and he said, the woman where they are staying is blackmailing them for more money. And if you can't earn any money, you know, my father couldn't go to work, our savings had disappeared, and he said, well, if the war still lasts much longer, she's going to throw us out anyway. So can you please find another place for us? Because we were not the resistance. And it was, already, it was already difficult to find new 
good places. Um, can't you hear it? Yeah, yeah it's okay. And um, <coughs> so it took my bus a few weeks, and eventually a Dutch nurse came forward and says she knows a good place. And should we come here? It's still up. You can ask. If not, I can do yeah. mine. You said not, not. Yeah, yeah can't you hear? Again. No, yes. it's yeah. gone back again. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, this nurse said she knows a good hiding place, and so my father and brother escaped in the morning, still when it was dark, um, to go to Amsterdam and met this nurse. Took her, took they took them to a nice home. And as I was so miserable those two years, um, and it was very near where we were staying, my parents had decided we would visit them, my brother and my father, which we did on that Sunday. And on Tuesday, it was my 15th birthday, and our host had saved up an egg for me for my breakfast. And we were sitting down to breakfast, and there was a knock on the door. They opened the door because daytime was always safe and the Nazis stormed in. And the right away went for us, my mother and me, and took us away. And we had no idea what has happened. And we, they took us to the Gestapo headquarters, and um, they interrogated me, and they beat me up. They wanted to know who had helped us, and so on. Really, I was in shock. I just lost my language, I couldn't speak and they really beat me very hard, and then they realized um, I wouldn't speak. So they took me and threw me in a little room, and I found my father and brother, and it turned out that this nurse was a double agent. She really worked for the Nazis, but pretended that she was a member of the resistance. Oh my God. This nurse betrayed in the same house over 200 people, and ma mainly those people never made it. Um, children, young people, she took in everybody and <coughs> betrayed them. And after the war, my mother was at her court case, she only got four years. But um, anyway, we were taken to a holding camp, and um, on the Friday, we were already put on transport. Um, the course, they never said where you were going, but Holland is the most western country, so east is bad news. So um, you might have seen the transportation of those transports. Um, I call it cattle truck or good train or even a container. They were just those metal um, trains with um, just the boards in it, um, a little slit of air, and two buckets they put in, one for toilets, about 80 people, one bucket for toilets for a day, and the other one for clean water. There was practically no air, people fainted. The only good thing was that we were still together as a family. My father, with tears in his eyes, apologized to us that from now on he won't be able to protect us anymore. And uh, my brother, tell you a little bit about him, he was um, actually a musician. Already when he was four years old, he could play piano. He had got a guitar, an accordion, and he could play any instrument. In this rented apartment, there was a piano. He could play the Rhapsody in Blue by heart. Stuart made a very difficult play. But in hiding, like me, like all the other people, he had to sit quiet and not make any noise. So he started to paint, and he created some amazing artwork. And in the cattle truck, one of the last conversations I had with him, he told me when they escaped from this um, house where the woman was blackmailing them, he hid the painting under the floorboards with a note on it. This belongs to Heinz and Erich Geiringer, and after the war, he's going to pick it up again. Yeah, so, and of course you can imagine it was a horrible, horrible journey. Eventually the train stopped and um, it was a beautiful May day. We heard dogs barking 
and shouting and the doors were slid open and uh, rouse, rouse, lots of Nazis and as well lots of people in the striped, um, we used to call it pyjamas, um, you might have seen pictures of that, um, caps and um, suits and um, they were all milling around, all very nervous and so on. And so we stood there looking around and we realized we were in Auschwitz. Now the world did know what Auschwitz was because the BBC, British Broadcast Corporation, sent um, broadcast out to all the occupied countries, uh, all of Europe, and telling the news what was happening with the war, but as well what was happening in Germany and Poland. And they always mentioned Auschwitz as the worst um, concentration camp, death camp, where Jewish people were systematically being gassed. So there was no secret whatsoever. And were you aware of that while you were there? Yeah, we, we knew. So the next command was men and women to different side. If ever you have been there visiting those horrible camps, it was a huge, huge area. There was Birkenau, which was the women camp, Auschwitz was the men camp. Mm -hmm. Then there was Canada, which was another part where all the belong, everything was confiscated, where it was sorted out. There was Monoway, another work camp. So a huge, huge area. And all really where people were all slow, quickly or slowly killed. And so the, you can imagine the goodbye between f men and women families. Um, and I will never forget my father who was not a religious man, took me by the hands with tears in his eyes. He said, God will protect you. You know, he knew he couldn't do anything for me, but he hoped perhaps if there is a God, he will look after me. Um, we were still in the clothes we had been um, arrested in and in Westerbork, the holding camp, some nice person had given my mother a hat and coat and said, well, perhaps it comes in handy. And my mother gave me that to wear. And um, so the hat had a big rim, a bit like the rabbi's hat. And um, so suddenly Mengele came, the camp doctor, I'm sure you've heard of him. He was mm -hmm. a normal, ordinary doctor, German doctor, about 40 years old. And, but he wasn't there to cure people, but he decided who was going to die and who was going to live. So he looked you over just for a fraction of a second and decided which side to go, life or death. And this had definitely saved my life at this time because he didn't see how young I was. We lost about half our Dutch transport all the children, all the toddlers, all young people, even uh, older girls than me, if they looked perhaps pale or they were not very tall, went to the wrong side. Of course, they didn't say what the wrong side was, but we realized those were the people who probably couldn't work anymore. So, and then eventually, um, we were herded into the camp, um, huge, huge um, barrack, um, the next command um, undressed completely naked and the Nazis were walking around um, laughing at our embarrassment. Then we had to go in front of a table. We had to give all uh, information about from which country we came, but from all of Europe, people were transported to so those terrible, terrible camps. And um, <coughs> so information what job you had, how old you are, all kinds of things. They asked us all written down. And then they told us, well, forget you, you're a human being. You're going to be tattooed with a number. If ever we want you, we are going to be call you out by your number. So we all got a number on our arm. The next step was that all our hair was shaved. Still naked, we stood there. And um, while this was going on, it took many, many hours. They told us those young Nazis with laughing, with pleasure that the family you have been separated from were told to go into a shower 
and then they started to laugh again and push each other and um, said, but of course it wasn't a shower, but they were gassed. So you can imagine how a mother who had just been separated from her child, how she started to cry hysterically and, and people held her and many, many people were completely desperate. And then we were um, um, released, um, still naked, and uh, we passed a huge heap of a mountain of clothes, and we were shown one garment, could have been a winter coat or even a night dress. The next um, heap were shoes, we were given two shoes, again, of course, never a pair, and that was all our belongings. Um, then we all, everything had to go quick, quick, quick. We ran um, into our barracks. Again, you might have seen pictures of that. Um, three high, big bunks, wood, nothing in it. Um, just the, the boards, um, not a bit of straw or a pillow or a blanket. And they told us, this is where you're going to live as long as you're still alive. And that won't be very long. So, you know, we, we were in shock, you know, we thought, well, how, how are we going to exist like this? And um, the only thing what was in those barracks, in those, uh, in this wood and in bank, were bed bugs and lice. So within a week, we were already covered in lice. Um, not just head lice, but body lice. Um, washing, you can forget about. Um, toilets. Um, at the end, you know, there were A, B, C, D, camp, um, barracks, both sides. In the middle was the Lagerstrasse, and at the end of that, there were two barracks. One with kind of cement um, holes, which were the toilets, and the other some with um, taps, which sometimes dribbled a little bit of water. So washing, forget about it. We never washed. We had to do from morning till evening very, very heavy physical work. Um, we had to start five o'clock, four o'clock, when it was still dark. We stood uh, two hours in front of the barrack to wait for our breakfast, which was a little mug of liquid. And then we were taken to work. In the evening, um, we came back again, two hours standing. If you moved, you were beaten rose like this, the camp was counted, and then we got our supper, which was a big chunk of bread. In daytime, we didn't get any food at all. So a lot of people tried to keep half of this bread for the next day, but you had nowhere to keep anything. So the only place where you could keep a piece of bread was um, under your head when you slept. But it happened very often that the person who slept next to you, while you slept, it fell from under your head, they ate it up. So we realized that if you want your portion of bread, you have to eat it in the evening. Um, very often it happened in the morning you woke up and the person who slept next to you didn't make it anymore. There were all kinds of illnesses, typhus, cholera, dysentery, and many, many, many people perished. You know, I, we, many of us here have read about this, but hearing it from your voice and your story is, what I was to say is many of us have read about what happened, about, but hearing it from your voice and hearing your story, how did you, with everything that they were doing to try and strip away your humanity, how did you keep your heart how did you keep your faith? Um, well, you know, as, as I said before, I had a wonderful family life. I was 15 years old. I just wasn't ready to die. So I never, ever gave up hope. Gave up hope. I really wanted to um, get a boyfriend. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have a family. And, you know, I held on. And, of course, being together with my mother, was a big, big help, but that was not the end of everything. Um, about once a, once a month, 
you were going into a shower. As I say, what we never washed, so we can mm. imagine how we were. When we were having a shower, it was wonderful. We were deloused as well. And um, so one day, it might have been, of course, every day was the same, but it started to be colder. I think it might have been perhaps end September, October, something like that. And we came out of the shower and just stood Mengele, and the selection was taking place. Meaning we had to naked turn around in front of him and he was going to decide if you are still able to work or not. So I was, I passed my mother, she was rather tall and as well you can imagine like any mother would do, very often she had given me part of her bread ration and she had become really very thin. And so Mengele looked at her, let her turn around once more and then he decided that she wasn't able to work anymore, and so he selected her to be guest. Um, about 40 of our transport, it was still the Dutch transport, we were together, um, women were selected to be guest. And those naked women walked out, and I thought I'd lost my mother. Um, so, I was, as you can imagine, I was desperate, became really very, very difficult to carry on. And um, I, I got more depressed. It was winter. I had a frostbite on my toes. I sometimes lost my shoes when I was walking through the snow. And um, I was sitting, um, working. We were in a, it was called weaving. We had a very, very tough job to do. And um, <coughs> I thought, I don't think I can hold on much longer. And um, a couple, those were the people who run the camp really under the supervision of the Nazis. Usually they were Polish criminals, um, women. Um, she called me out, she said, somebody wants you outside. And I thought, well, <laughs> that's it now. And I go outside and there was an SS man with my father. This was just amazing. And of course, I fell into his arms, and um, I asked him how is Heinz. He said he's, he's okay. And then he asked how is Mutti, my mom. And I burst into tears, and I said she had been selected. I saw this man, he was a strong man. I saw him go even paler as he was already, and started to cry. and. Um, it was, it was so sad to see him in this, you know, to s realize that he had lost his wife. But then he got back his courage and he said, you have to hold on, the war will soon be finished, we'll be together again, and Muti will look after us, will protect us from above. And I still saw him twice more, he came, and then I didn't see him anymore. In the meantime, the Russians seemed to be approaching but as of course, we didn't really know, but we realized the Nazis became very, very nervous. There was not so much control anymore. Sometimes we were not even called out to work. And you know, I said A, B, C come, many, many cabs all cut off by electrified barbed wire, but sometimes the gates were open and um, many of the Nazis had run away as well. And, um, some people, Dutch people from our transport came from another part of the camp and they told me that they'd seen my mother. And I thought they were just encouraging me and um, you know, I, could, I didn't believe it. I said, well, that can't be, you know. I said, yeah, yes, definitely we have seen her in this and this part of the camp. See if perhaps one day you can get there. And I did. I was able, after a few days, I was able to get there, and, and my mother was really there. Mm -hmm. It was a barrack where people were actually not working anymore. It was very, very weak, but she was there. So that was, of course, an amazing, amazing oh, okay. uh, miracle. And um, <coughs> um, it's not yet time. No. <laughs> And um, <coughs> so, but a, a terrible thing, and this is what I still um, feel guilty about, that I had told my father that my mother 
having made it. So, um, and then, um, as I say, the Russian obviously really were coming, and the Nazis emptied the camp every day. Um, many barracks were emptied, and the people uh, disappeared. And again, by luck, my mother and me didn't go on those transport. After the war, they were called the death marches. You might have heard of mm -hmm. them, because many, many thousands of people had to march from Poland, um, partly to Germany or to Austria, and um, un with no clothes practically, and in the snow with very little food. Um, sometimes they went by train, but hundreds of people pushed out in trains, open wagons and things like that. So many, many, many people perished on those death marches, because we didn't know about this. And, um, and one day we woke up, so there were perhaps five, six hundred women left in this whole huge Birkenau camp. And it was very, very quiet, no shouting, no dogs barking. And we went outside, and the camp was deserted. And um, so we were left on our own. The gates were open. We could have gone out, but of course, we had to go. Um, in the middle of snow, we had no money, we had no clothes, so we stayed there. And then after another few days, um, we were looking around, we were looking for food, we had to hack the ice to get some water or melt the snow somehow. And um, at the gates took a huge creature, all in fur and icicles on, on his beard and his head and things. And it was, first it looked like a bear, but when we looked closer, it was a Russian soldier. You know, there were those big fur hats and things. <laughs> And um, <coughs> he came in, and um, he looked at uh, those women lying in the banks and in the beds and bunks, and it was really, you know, he was speechless. He had no idea what he would find, but he explained, Polish people could speak with him. He explained that um, he was a scout to find out if the Germans were still here, and um, he's going to report back that the army can march forward. And within a few days, the uh, Russian army came. That is now 27th of January, the liberation of Auschwitz. Um, it was, yes, liberation, but not really liberation. The Russians were fighting, so they were pursuing the Nazis. They stayed the night, they cooked uh, for themselves, but as well for us. They gave us those metal bowls with cabbage soup, um, very greasy cabbage soup, but the s smell of it, you know, drove us nearly mad. We were really starving, and there we got this wonderful, wonderful soup. And we ate and ate and ate, but I've never had a worse painful night on a bucket because <laughs> the food <laughs> went straight through me. You know things are bad when you're looking up at cabbage soup. <laughs> but, you know, when you can't digest it, and in the morning, people had died because they were too weak to digest it. Um, and the Russians left again. And then I decided I would go to Auschwitz with somebody else to see if I would find my father and brother. Yes, and we went there, and the Russian had made their headquarters there because Auschwitz, if you've ever been, there were brick building. It was much more solid than in Birkenau. And, um, so I asked permission, if, but she didn't mm -hmm. care. They were administrators, they were busy doing things. And I looked everywhere, and I saw a man who looked vaguely familiar, but he looked very thin and gray. And I went to him and I said, I think I've seen you before somewhere. And he said, yes, I'm Otto Frank and his father. And, and you are Eva Geiriger. I said, yes. And of course, he asked me, have you seen my girls or my wife? And I hadn't seen him, seen them. But he had seen my uh, father and brother, so I didn't know about death marches. So mm -hmm. I was sure the war will end soon and we will be together again. And um, then the Russians, and this I will really point out to you, the Russians were really, really very good to us. They realized it was dangerous for us to stay there. So they organized transport for us, food for us, they gave us Russian uniforms, and they transported us for four months um, till we ended up in Odessa. 
that's a very, very interesting story, what happened in this big, long journey through war, um, um, country, everything was destroyed in Poland, in Russia, in Romania, and eventually we ended up in Odessa, and which is Ukraine now, but still was Russia, and there we waited for the end of the war. And when that came in May, we realized we had survived. But of course, we still wanted to go back to um, Amsterdam to see if our family had returned. And Otto Frank was with us on this journey. And um, <coughs> so that took again, there came a New Zealand troop transport ship and we had a journey through the Mediterranean um, till we went into Marseille and then long journey up um, back into the Netherlands. So we got there in June. So from end of January till June, we were traveling. And then we were deposited there, and that was it. You know, and we had expected there will be a welcoming committee, people will look after us, nothing. And then we realized, um, you know, all the other countries had been liberated already by the Americans and the British, um, uh, Belgium, France, uh, Italy, of course, was the fighter. Greece, oh, and, and Denmark, Norway had all been freed, but Holland was occupied by the Nazis till the end of the war, till May, and the Germans took everything the Dutch produced to feed their own people. And in Holland, it was called the hunger winter. There were no cats and dogs, can you imagine, had all been eaten. Um, people went to the farm, to come back with one potato to feed a family of five. There were in apartments where found families, father, mother, three children, dead from starvation. And then more refugees came, people returning. Um, and they just didn't have any means of looking after us. So um, it was really very, very difficult but we were very lucky we were able to get into our apartment because it was furnished and it belonged to a Christian. So Otto Frank, when he came back, he was with us on this long, long journey, had um, nowhere to go because his apartment, somebody else moved in and all the furniture was always confiscated and shipped to Germany to the bombed cities. And I read once that the Germans could never have carried on the war so long if they wouldn't have used all this looted um, material from all the people who went in the camp. All this was shipped back to Germany. And as well, the apartments where Jewish people had lived, the furniture, everything was shipped to Germany. And so we waited for news. And then we got the news from the Red Cross. Um, very casual, we have to tell you, um, to my mother, that your husband with name, with even his birth date, and your son perished in Mauthausen several days before the American army came to liberate that camp. Well, that was our last straw. I had really, really thought they would come back. Otto Frank as well came to tell us about the terrible news that his whole family had perished, his wife and his two girls. After he left, um, my mother said, how can this man carry on with his life? He was 57 years old. Uh, he had nothing really to live for. And then a few days later, he came again with a little parcel under his arm. And he said, I must show you something. And he opened it very carefully. And you can guess what it was. It was Anna's diary. And he said, can I read something to you? And he opened it and he started to read, but he always burst into tears. It took him three weeks to read this book. And he was amazed what she had written. And he showed it to everybody and he showed it to a history professor. And he said, it is your duty to publish it. Yeah. But you know, a diary is something very private and he wasn't quite sure that Anne really wanted to have it known to the world what she has written. And as well, unfortunately, they had a very bad relationship with their mother at that time. And 
his wife was dead, so how could he publish this, you know? Um, so actually he edited it, he left out quite a lot. But if you buy now the diary, after Otto died, the Dutch government, he left the diary to the Dutch government and they decided they would publish the whole diary, how, how he really wrote it. And then um, after we realized Otto was, well, he was still, of course, very, very, very sad, but it helped him to, to, act, to do something. I said to my mother, we have to go and find my brother's paintings, which we did, and indeed we found over 30 paintings and many, many poems, and this is what I inherited from what was left from Hans. But you know, I always felt so guilty that I had told my father that my mother wasn't alive anymore. And I always was speculating, he probably, probably my brother died first, he thought his wife was dead, probably I couldn't have survived, so I think he gave up. If he would only have known, perhaps he would still be alive. So this was basically what happened. And I, after I realized we will never ever be a family again, became very, very depressed. And I was full and full of hatred. And it was Otto Frank, he came very often to our house. And he had no hatred. And I couldn't understand that. And he said, well, you know, if you hate people, they are not suffering, they don't even know. But you, you will become a miserable person. And I said, yeah, I am miserable. But I just couldn't help, couldn't help this hatred. But he kept on telling me, you know, you are young, you have a whole life in front of you, things will get better, and, and he encouraged me. But I, I must say I was really very, very depressed. I found, when after my mother died, I found that she had collected all things what I had written, and I found a little note which I wrote dated 1st of January 1946, I wrote, life without my family is useless. Um, I really don't want to live. I would like to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I was so miserable after Auschwitz. Not in Auschwitz, but after Auschwitz. So you can imagine, I must have had, I had nightmares. I saw everything always in front of me. And um, I didn't want to go to school, but Otto said, uh, good education is the only thing nobody can take away from you. And so I went to school, but I didn't enjoy it. When the pupils had pranks on teachers, they thought it was hilarious, and I felt sorry for the teacher. And so it was miserable. And when I finished, I didn't know what to do, and Otto and my mother decided I should become a photographer. And um, Otto, who had taken many, many pictures of his children, he said, um, I have um, <coughs> no family anymore. I'm never going to take photos. So he gave me his Leica, which is one of the best cameras. Yes. And um, <coughs> so I said, OK. And Otto knew somebody in London who had a photographic studio. And he got me a job there. So I went to London for one year. And I lived in a little boarding house where an uh, Israeli young man had come to study economics and he worked as well, and um, we became friends. And, but we didn't tell who we were. I, did, I told him I was Dutch, which I wasn't. He told me he was an Israeli, which he wasn't. He was a German <laughs> refugee. And um, you know, we didn't tell who we were, nothing at all, just about how our day went, about um, what we were going to try to eat. England was still on rations. It was very, very difficult to uh, you know, it was foggy, and it was not, not a nice time to be in England at the time. Um, and we went for long walks and so on. And then after six months, he said to me, Eva, I fall in love with you. Um, mm -hmm. Will you marry me? And when I finish my studies, we can start a new life and go to Israel. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> because I have a widowed mother um, in Amsterdam, and of course, you know, I was very, very close to my mother. I would never have just gone off. And um, 
So he thought, well, perhaps I changed my mind one day. And then Otto Frank, who um, visited me quite often, he had business as well in London. And um, I told him, you know, this young man has asked me to marry him, but of course I said no. And then he got a bit embarrassed and he said, well, you know, your mother and me have fallen in love as well. <laughs> and once you get settled, um, uh, we'd like to get married. So I went back to this young man and said, well, you can marry me now. <laughs> no. Which he was really very, very pleased. And we went to, to um, Amsterdam because we didn't know anybody in London and um, got married there in 1952. And Otto and my mother got married a year later in 1953. And they were married for 27 years longer than they were married with their first spouses. Mm -hmm. And I was married 63 years. And um, unfortunately, I lost my husband a few years ago. But uh, you know, we didn't really know each other. We took a big gamble. <laughs> but it turned well, out, it turned out to be, that, that it turned out to be, it was a good choice. <laughs> and you know, when I tell that in schools, um, I was married 63 years. She said, with how many husbands? <laughs> uh, well, Eva, and I said, just one. I think that we're all inspired by your story, but it, it's not an easy one to tell. And, and quite frankly, I can still hear some of that survivor's guilt when you talk about your father and your mother. For decades, this wasn't a story that you shared. Why are you sharing it now with us and across the country? I didn't talk for 40 years, I didn't. Um, you know, when we came back, and not just me, all the survivors, we were desperate to talk what has happened to us, but the world didn't want to hear. Everybody had suffered, the war was really, really terrible. Millions of people have perished, and people wanted to get on, and the motto, never again Auschwitz, was what people thought. And at first it was like that, you know, people really helped each other, mm -hmm. looked after each other, trying to rebuild the world again. But you know, then started Cambodia, Korea, Vietnam, um, Bosnia, all the time there were wars again and perse persecution, Muslims, Jews, Christian, it just didn't end. And um, when I started to speak in 1986, I realized the world has to know what has happened and we have to create a better and safer world. And um, people were started to be really interested, wanting to learn their Holocaust stories. Um, the uh, universities have, uh, have um, lectures about it. There's a lot of books have t um, in, the, in the 80s and 90s have come out. Um, have become very, very popular. The films have come out and the world really wants to know. And I think we have, have great hope for the young people here, especially in the university, where I speak mainly in the universities, and not only for Jewish people, but for everybody, Absolutely. that we have to work together to create a safer, better world. We don't want to give our children a future which is so full of hatred and prejudice. And I think we have to realize now much more than ever that this hatred has to stop. And it is still there, unfortunately. And the, like the rabbi said, anti-Semitism is on the rise. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the history, anti-Semitism has always been. I don't think it will ever disappear, but we we are here to last. And um, I work a lot with Chabad, and I must say, um, as I say, I'm not, uh, I do believe, I think, you know, the birth of my first daughter was really a miracle. And um, so I'm still searching, and this is, I think, we all search. But what I still can't understand is that most hatred is through different religions. Um, uh, Muslims kill other Muslims, and um, uh, Christian kill Jews, and Jews are the only people really who don't attack other people. And um, 
we are ex a, an example for the world, I think. I'm very, very proud to be a Jew, and um, I'm still searching, I still don't know, did God protect me, or was it just by chance? And But this is a mystery of life, we will never know. And um, as I say, I'm so I was not always an optimist, but I have seen now, and I've got five grandchildren who are all really wonderful people, help people out, um, help in the soup kitchens and with clothes, and you know, there's a lot of wonderful charities who are trying to improve things for p people. But I think we have to work together to, leave, to not leave the refugees stranded somewhere in the middle of the sea and drown. This is, I mean, in Europe we hear this daily. The ships are trying to um, leave from um, uh, Asia or from Africa, and the world just doesn't care, and the people drown. This is not acceptable anymore in the 21st century. We are unquestionably living in... We are unquestionably living in difficult times. That's why it is so important that we gather here and listen to your story and find our common humanity and inspiration in what you have lived in the story and where you have come from because your caring, your caring is so incredibly, your, oh, sorry. I, what I was going to say is that we are living in difficult times. I don't think there's any question about that. That's why we are all so grateful that at this moment you are willing to, through your pain, reach out to all of us in our common humanity. Um, I know that I speak for all of us in thanking you from the bottom of my heart, the bottom of our hearts, for being brave and speaking out because it is something that we all need to hear. The proof that so many people have come to hear it is a proof that people want to know and want to change. Thank you very much for coming to listen to me, and I'm sure you're going to do your bit to change the well, attitude of people and to block yes. out all this discrimination against people who are different from yourself. Yes, we, we this will. This is really what we have to accept. Oops. Thank you. Oops. I'd like to ask. I would very much like to welcome Chabad co director Miriam Weingarten to say a few closing words. Miriam ensures that Chabad is a home away from home for our Jewish students, and we're so grateful for the sense of community and belonging that you create. Please, welcome. That was special, thank you. Thank you, Eva and President Kause, for such a meaningful and informative evening. I now understand more about the horrors that my grandfather, Avram David Wilhelm, the namesake of our son of Remo, experienced in Auschwitz. Can all of us take a moment and imagine? Imagine Eva and President Kause sitting on stage, having this conversation in an empty room. You are the true heroes for coming out tonight and ensuring that Eva's message and the memory of the Holocaust is not forgotten. Eva and President Kause, this is our little way of saying thank you for giving your time, heart, soul, and energy to make tonight the spectacular evening it was. Thank you.
There are a limited amount of autographed books called Eva's Story Outside. They are very limited. There will be a line in the uh, lounge right outside the ballroom.